I'd like to welcome everybody to this panel on uh, consciousness and intelligence. And we have with us three distinguished uh, panel members to discuss some of the most difficult and most fundamental problems in the entire domain of mind and brain. So let me start by introducing the speakers, and I will not go into the full list of their academic distinctions and so forth, of which there are many, but I will focus briefly on the relation to the topic of today, namely uh, consciousness and intelligence. I will do it in alphabetical, uh, alphabetic order, starting with Ned Block on the left. He's the Silver Professor of Philosophy, Psychology, and Neural Sciences at New York University. He works on the philosophy of mind and foundations of neuroscience and cognitive science. He is the past president of the Society of Philosophy and Psychology and of the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness. Um, he has many, of course, many, many publications, but a collection of his papers uh, on functionalism, consciousness, and representation uh, is a two large volumes published by MIT Press. Christoph Koch is the Lewis and Victor uh, Trondel Professor of Cognitive Behavioral Biology at Caltech. Uh, he's currently on leave from Caltech, and he's the Chief Scientific Officer at the Allen Institute of Brain Science in Seattle. Uh, with his long-term collaborator, Francis Crick, uh, he pioneered the scientific study of consciousness and he's the author of the uh, well-known book, The Quest for, for Consciousness. And there is a new book by Christoph about to be published shortly, I believe, uh, titled Consciousness, Confessions of a Romantic Reductionist. Um, and the third member, Giulio Tononi, is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, the main co uh, focus of Giulio's work has been for a long time, the uh, scientific understanding of consciousness, uh, and also a large body of work on the function of sleep with close connections to the study of consciousness as well. Among his publications, there is a book with Jerry Edelman that many of you probably have seen, uh, which is called A Universe of Consciousness, How Matter Becomes Imagination. Uh, and a more recent book on the topic of consciousness titled The, Neu the Neurology of Consciousness, cognitive neuroscience and neuropathology. Now, let me say just very few words about the topic and then uh, call upon the three members uh, of the panels. Um, and the order will be Giulio Tononi, followed by Christoph, and uh, finally, Ned Block. Now, clearly, consciousness is one of the most intriguing and most important topics in the study of the mind and the brain, and I think in science in general. It is also very special and very, very unique because consciousness cannot really be studied uh, in the same, using the same scientific tools which have been proven success, uh, successful in many other methods of science, uh, <coughs> areas of science. So because of this, consciousness has been sort of left out of the study of in, in science for many, many years. And only recently, uh, there has been a revival, or I even say a revolution, and consciousness came back into the mainstream of scientific studies. And this was in large part following the pioneering studies and discussions which were led by Francis Crick and Christoph Koch. And I think that another reason for why uh, consciousness came back into the mainstream of scientific studies has been the advance of certain new technical tools like the fMRI that allowed us for the first time to study uh, brain processes in the conscious human, human brain in a way that were not possible using previous techniques like EEG, uh, brain lesion, and so on. Uh, so suddenly it became possible to have uh, human subjects and uh, put them under conditions where they are either conscious or unconscious of uh, what happens in the brain and we can look at the uh, brain activation and try to make uh, correlations and, um, uh, and conclusions about the uh, um, perhaps even some causal, but at least correlations between certain brain activations and uh, conscious, conscious states. 
Now, the scientific study of consciousness raises many, many different questions and problems, and we will not tackle them uh, all today. The goal is more restricted. We will focus on the issues of uh, relationship between consciousness and intelligence. And there are many interesting and uh, intriguing possibilities that we would like uh, the panel members to, uh, uh, to address in their presentation in the subsequent discussions. Uh, for example, uh, we would like to discuss and consider whether consciousness is in some sense a byproduct, whether it comes about by intelligent processing. So if you have something which uh, uh, carries on intelligent information processing, whether this in some sense makes the system uh, become conscious, whether if we build machines, for example, that will become more and more intelligent, where we can, whether we can expect that some form of awareness may result from the mere fact that they are producing highly intelligent processing. Or in the other direction, one can ask whether consciousness is necessary for highly intelligent processing, whether to become really intelligent, to in some deep sense really understand uh, uh, certain concepts, whether this uh, involves some, some form of consciousness and whether if we want to build truly intelligent machines, they will have to, we will have to understand something about consciousness, consciousness, and we will have to make sure that in some sense these machines have some form of, of awareness or whether this is not uh, at all a necessary condition. Now, we cannot hope, of course, to answer these questions. These are, uh, are completely, these are very deep and complicated questions that we are just starting to, um, to deal with, but I hope that some interesting discussions will follow and, and also that we will get at least some feeling for the kind of scientific techniques or what kind of scientific investigations in the uh, domains of brain science, in the domain of uh, machine intelligence could help us uh, provide some better understanding of the problems that we are uh, discussing today. So we will have now a sequence of three presentations. Since there are only three of us and not four or more, we will um, be able to be a little bit more relaxed with time and have slightly more uh, longer presentations, but not very long. We will keep them still rather short. And then uh, we will open it for discussions, first within the panel, and then we will open, uh, open it up also to uh, questions for the audience. So I would like to call upon the first uh, speaker, Julio, please. Thank you, Shimon. So in uh, exactly the same year in which uh, MIT was founded, Thomas Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, who wasn't really shy about anything and thought everything could be explained, said consciousness cannot be explained. Because as we all know, and as we heard two nights ago at the beginning of this symposium, even 150 years later, there are many people who think that we'll never be able to bridge the gap from matter mechanism to imagination and experience. Now, it has been said, for instance, that consciousness cannot be defined. I actually believe it's actually much easier to define than intelligence itself. I usually define it as that thing that goes away when you fall into dreamless sleep, or are anesthetized, or somebody hits you on the head, or presumably when you die. It also has been said that in 50 years or so, this was two nights ago. Consciousness, we won't even talk about it. It will have gone away. I would believe that that may be so, but if it is so, the universe would be a pretty empty place then. So having said that, and remembering why the problem is so difficult, I want to bring back a couple of facts I'm particularly fond of. They are very big facts about the brain and consciousness that tell us that an explanation must be there, and there must be a very special relationship between mechanism and form. So what you see there is an old pet image of the activity of the cerebrum, largely the cerebral cortex, and as you heard from Christoph yesterday, that has roughly 16 billion neurons in humans. And then underneath, the cerebellum, which is smaller, but has more neurons, roughly 50 billion or so. Now, the cerebellum is a wonderful kind of machine. It has more neurons, as I said. It has all kinds of connections, neurotransmitters, neuromodulators, genes. It's incredibly complex. It has maps of the environment. It controls movement. It connects to the cortex. 
and it learns beautifully. It's extremely plastic. So you may want to decide for yourself whether it is intelligent or not. But one thing is for sure. If you take away the cerebellum completely from the brain, your consciousness is essentially unchanged. There's the same person having the same feelings, seeing the same shapes and colors, and hearing the same sounds, and so on and so forth. If I take away your cerebral cortex, nothing is left. You're not there anymore. So there is something about this beautiful, complicated machine, very intelligent and capable of learning, which is just not good enough to generate even a glimmer of experience. That tells us something, or at least it should. Another example I'm fond of is the sleeping brain, especially during that early phase of slow wave sleep, in which if I wake you up, you are not there. You have nothing to report. As far as you're concerned, the world is not there, you are not there. Nothing is there. But if we look at neural activity, this is a cat, but the same is true in humans, as we now know. In a high order visual area, presumably involved in consciousness, you can see the activity continues unabated. Firing rates are very much the same as in quiet wakefulness, with very, very small interruptions like these. So there are some interesting differences, but the brain is remarkably active. The same cortex is remarkably active, and yet our experience disappears altogether. Now, this is not only of practical significance to address consciousness and understand how it's generated. It's, of course, also important when you consider situations like this. This is the cortex of a healthy human brain. And this is a vegetative patient of Nico Schiff, in which you see most of the brain is annihilated, most of the cortex, but there are some islands of activity that are actually reasonably normal, let's say in areas of the brain that deal with color. If those parts of the brain are preserved, one can ask, will there be somebody there experiencing just colors, for instance, but nothing else? Will there be nobody there at all? Those are questions that we definitely need to know the answer to. For instance, what if that were an area for pain? Okay, will there be pain forever excruciating, or will there be nothing at all? And on the left, you see a case of dementia in which the brain fragments into pieces of activity, and as we all know, by seeing some older people become demented, it becomes difficult to know whether there is anybody home. So we should start looking at science to provide at least some potential answer to these questions. Now, these questions apply then to everything. We heard today about development. You know, that the neural activity that happens, the, first, the only PET study really in infants like that, that happens early in the brain of an infant. Some areas show up. Is there, again, some experience associated with that? Is it the blooming confusion some people talk about? Or even more consciousness than you find in adults, as others have said? Or if you go to animals, which is preferred by philosophers because, of course, that is one situation where it's very difficult to imagine what it feels like to be a bat. If you have a brain like this, though, which is not too unlike ours, maybe they do experience something like we do. What's the answer to that? And I particularly like the moray eel, uh, in eel because that is a philosophical animal by excellence. Look at how it looks and how it thinks. And the kind of brain it has here is extremely different from ours. Okay, so how much consciousness is there? And of course, the theme of the symposium is more about how much consciousness is there or will there be in machines that may be highly intelligent by any criterion, any machine that we may already have. How do we go about addressing those questions? I think the way you have to go is to develop a theory. You've heard many times the call for theories that are needed in addition to empirical studies to understand the mind, and consciousness is probably the place where theory is most important. So a theory of consciousness needs to do several things. One is to define what consciousness is, what determines the quantity and quality. Another thing is to be able to go back to neuroscience and account in a parsimonious manner for many empirical observations, like why the cerebrum and not the cerebellum, why wake and not early slow wave sleep, and so on and so forth. There are many other examples. And even account for those aspects of phenomenology that right now seem ineffable, like what makes the experience of pure red different from that of pure blue, or of a sound, or of the scene that is in front of me right now. All those questions must have a scientific explanation. Now, the two axioms that I believe are most important to understand what consciousness is come actually straight from phenomenology. You don't need to do any science or experiments to know that. You know it directly. The first one 
is that every experience by itself is extraordinarily informative. Not because of how many chunks of information are contained in it, but because of what it rules out. Whenever we have an experience, the one you're having right now, it rules out trillions and trillions of other possible experiences you could have had, but you didn't, and it distinguishes it from them in that particular way, from each and every one of them. That is the essence of information, no matter how you want to measure it. And so that's the key feature of consciousness. Every experience is what it is because it is different in a particular way from many, many multitudinous other ones. But there is a second related feature that we cannot forget, and that's the integration. Meaning every experience is what it is and cannot be decomposed into independent parts. We can talk about the various pieces, you know, what's on the left and what's on the right, but we cannot experience them as independent things. It doesn't even make sense. In fact, to be able to experience the left side of the visual field independent of the right side, or the shape independent of the color, you would need to split the brain. In fact, split brain patients are the only one who can do that, but then they have two consciousness and not one. So now, the basic idea, purely from phenomenology then, is that given those two key features of consciousness, any physical systems that generate consciousness should be able to be treated as a single entity, it should be one, that's the integration part, and at the same time, it should have a huge repertoire of distinguishable states due to its own mechanism. Those two requirements have to be there together, and if any of them goes away, consciousness should vanish. If the repertoire of states decreases, the system becomes like a coin instead of a die with a trillion faces as depicted here, then you have a little repertoire. So any state of the system can only distinguish between two. The world is divided into two things, this or not this. Or vice versa, if you lose the integration, the system breaks down into many little pieces that may store a lot of information if you want, represent a lot of information, but it's not a single entity anymore. So we'll see there are already examples and there are experiments we can do to address these two properties in the brain. But before I go there, let me tell you, at least in principle, how one can go ahead now and develop conceptual tools and finally measures to capture these two notions of information and integration. What you see here is simply, you know, the very simplest physical system, three end gates, simple Boolean gates that happen to be all three of them A, B, and C off. The way to look at this, I think, is to imagine that for every physical mechanism in a particular state, there is a co corresponding information structure. And the first thing we want to know about that information structure is, can it be decomposed into independent parts or is it integrated? And you can do that by asking, what is the information generated by these three end gates when they are off? Well, if you work through this example, you will see that they rule out some possible states. The system couldn't have been in certain states, but it could have been in some others. And if you divide it in two parts along this minimum information partition here, something is lost. That is, the system, the whole, cannot be reduced to the sum, or in this case, the product of the parts. And this is a precise definition of the extent to which the whole is more than the sum of the parts information. Now that is a way to define a quantity called phi that tells us exactly how much more the whole is than the parts. But there is more to that and I will only indicate it briefly. So that very causal structure here in a particular state, if you work it out, cannot be decomposed so it's integrated, but it will specify many different probability distributions. And those are supposed to be the very distinctions that make every experience what it is. Now I'm showing this for a system of three end gates that are off. You can only imagine what kind of information structure would be generated by the appropriate parts of one of our brains. It is indeed impossible to even contemplate right now, but it's probably expressing somewhat the richness of experience. Now with such tools at hand, one can then go back to neuroscience and look at those examples and many more that I mentioned before, facts we know about consciousness. So why is the cortex capable of generating uh, consciousness, at least some parts of it? Well, the cortex is ideally structured for that from this perspective. It's made of functional specialists, specialists that do different things, we heard it many times, and yet they all talk to each other. That's ideal for generating a lot of integrated information, a lot of phi. By contrast, the cerebellum is a wonderful machine, intelligent if you wish, 
but it is composed of little modules that hardly talk to each other at all. So it really decomposes into many pieces, each of which generates very little integrated information. And there is no integrated information structure corresponding to the cerebellum as a whole. That, I think, is the answer to why the cerebellum can't do that. There are many other things one can do. I just want to show you one, uh, one experiment in which one tests some of the very basic notions of this theory by going to the sleeping brain, that early part of sleep when we are unconscious, and one can use transcranial magnetic stimulation to perturb a particular portion of the brain and see how the cortex reacts to that perturbation. And we can see here, well, I hope we can. Um, I'm not sure if I can start the movie, let me see, yes. If you perturb the brain when he is awake, you will see that under the coil, this brain reacts very strongly, and then the, reaction, the activation of the brain jumps around in all kinds of places in the cortex, indicating the system is behaving as a single entity. You touch it and it rolls around in all kinds of ways for roughly a third of a second. It's integrated and it has a vast repertoire of states, just as you would expect when you're awake and conscious. And you do the same thing in the same subject, in the same place, at the same intensity, when you are unconscious early in sleep. And what you see there is that the brain is indeed active, it is reactive, it is responding very strongly to the stimulation, but that activity doesn't go anywhere. The system doesn't behave like an integrated entity anymore. It actually breaks down into pieces. And every time you perturb a piece, only that piece will respond and not the rest of the cortex. So when consciousness vanishes, the integration is vanished too in the cortex. We have now seen this not only in sleep, and we have seen it return when you're asleep but dreaming. We have seen the same thing integration vanishing and consciousness vanishing in anesthesia. We have seen this in vegetative patients who are unconscious, and by contrast, we've seen the response of the brain turning again integrated when the person becomes minimally conscious, presumably experienced as resurfaced there. So let me finish by giving you then, based on this theory, a recipe for building a conscious system. The minimal ingredients are, you need then a system which is a single entity, that's the integration, so it cannot be decomposed into informationally independent subsystems. You need that system to have a very large repertoire of distinguishable states by virtue of its own mechanisms, that's the information part. And when you put that together, you will get a system that's actually capable of generating a very large set of informational relationship. And to prepare the transition to the next presentation, let me show you one picture to try and illustrate this notion. We have heard many times earlier in the symposium that we now have subsystems, very sophisticated ones, that can build can deal with restricted task domains very well. They can identify, for instance, pedestrians. They can identify street signs. They can identify where the road ends. And you can imagine, actually you have been told that in the next four or five years, we have a plethora of these that are going to be able to do in their own limited domain a job probably better than that that anyone can do. Each of them within its limited domain. And the information structures generated by them can be summarized as local, independent and limited. But when we look at this scene, where there are some obviously wrong things and some that are not so obvious, when we look at that scene, what the claim is, is somewhere in our brain, there is a single large integrated information structure being generated. This is the trivial one generated by three logical gates, but as I say, imagine the one that really happens there. And the claim here is that this kind of intelligence, the one that is context sensitive, that is needed to uh, approach task domains that cannot be decomposed into independent parts, and that's the world. Well, that kind of intelligence presupposes consciousness. In fact, the claim is stronger. That kind of intelligence is actually consciousness. Thanks. Thank you, Christoph. Um, you can watch time, the clock is there. <coughs> All right, I'll be brief. Uh, this past Christmas, I spent um, 10 days with um, um, enjoying the hospitality of um, Giulio and Chiara. 
in, uh, in medicine. In between readings of uh, Dante, we thought about um, this question of um, how uh, the theory of uh, the integrated information theory of consciousness, how would that apply to, to machines? And I think some of those thoughts are highly germane to what we are trying to answer here, which is the relationship between intelligence and consciousness. This is going to come out um, next week. So the, 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 the two axiomatic principles that um, Julie just uh, mentioned for, for his integrated theory of consciousness is A, both are sort of, we, uh, we experience both of them. One of them that every conscious experience excludes a, a stupendous large number of sheer uncountable number of other experiences that we could have had. So in the visual domain, even image of black, if I were, let's, you know, yesterday night I arrived, um, um, two nights ago I arrived, I woke up in my hotel room at, f at five in the morning, was, it was still dark, and sort of it took me a couple of seconds to orient myself where I was in this new place, but even that experience just of, of black, it still rules out seeing, you know, the burning twin towers, seeing, you know, rules out seeing the daughter, my, um, the face of my, of my daughter, or seeing, you know, every movie, every, every image of every movie that's ever been made. At the same time, this is a point that's always been emphasized by philosophers uh, such as Ned, Ned Bloch, is um, conscious experience, the, the current content of what you're conscious of, okay, is, um, is unitary, is holistic. Now that might sound very airy-fairy to many, to many scientists, but what, what it means that, it, that what you're currently conscious of, you apprehend as one and you don't subdivide. You, you are unable to subdivide. Of course, what you can do in terms of images, I can shift my eyes or my head towards the left or to the right, but once I see something, whatever I consciously apprehend, I cannot subdivide anymore. So for instance, when I, when I consciously apprehend right now with the current state of my attention and my eyes, the scene in front, in front of me, namely you, I'm unable to sort of consciously just, you know, apprehend the left half separate from the right half. I'm consciously unable to, for example, see only black and white information that surely is available in my, in my visual system. We know this, but I, I also see color. I'm unable not to see color, right, unless there's something wrong with my, with my photoreceptor. I'm unable, if something moves and I have a properly functioning MT and motor system, I'm unable not to perceive the, the motion if it f forms part of this one conscious experience. And so from that is the idea that, in, uh, that, um, that conscious is a sort of an, a set of information, that consciousness, which is really experience, that's what it's just a different word for what we experience all the time, is just a set of informational relationship and they have to be A, highly differentiated, certainly if you care about human, hu uh, human level consciousness, and they have to be highly integrated. And this leads to, t uh, to ways to, t uh, to possible test this. In um, an analogy to, of course, you all know the famous article by Turing published in 1950, you know, where you play the imitation game, you put a, a man and a woman in two rooms, and then you have a third, a, a third operator, a quarry, who tries to find out who's a man and who's a woman. The modern version is, a, is, a, is a slightly different, but it's the same idea. So this sort of would be a test that you can apply in principle to machines in the domain of images. We prefer images because images are immensely more richer than words. After all, an image is worth more than a thousand words. So this is just a, a system capacity for integrated information, thus for consciousness can be measured by asking how much information the system contains above and beyond that contained by its individual parts. Uh, so as I said, pictures contain a huge amount of implicit information that we all have uh, direct conscious access to unless you're, if, you know, if you're a healthy, neurological, normal um, individual. And so a test to, uh, for integrated information, if you have a particular machine, uh, and you're interested to what extent um, is, it, is it conscious, let's leave apart the question to, uh, for a moment to, to the extent to which it's really intelligent, you can ask, you can ask it what, what Shimon did yesterday. So you can show the, um, an ima the computer in a very large number of images, and you can try to get it to interpret what it is and try to make sense of this image. One way, there's so much information in any given image, all the relationship in an image the, among the different parts that, that we've implicit access to in terms of their, their spatial relationship, in terms of their perspective cues, in terms of the semantic content, but also in terms of the individual ele physical element that, that, that make up an image. And we have those because they're implemented in our brain, they're implemented both as a product of our genes, of our, the experience of our forefathers, as well as our personal experiences that we have in, our, in, in, uh, in early childhood. So, uh, so one way to address this is to, is to generate images and to ask them 
machine to make sense of those images. A different way is to do it, the one I'm going to pursue here briefly, is to ask a machine what's wrong with these images. So, you know, as children, we, we played, you know, we had these puzzles where we had to find out what's wrong with, um, with an image, and you can do the same thing with a computer. And a computer, the, the, the space of things that could be wrong with an image is gigantic. It, it's not only the, some, the things that I'll show you with, and that could be semantically wrong with an image. So for example, you put an image of a bicycle in a refrigerator, and obviously we know that that doesn't make sense. But you could also manipulate images to show that the, the physics of the image is obviously impossible. And you can, given all the pixels that make up an image, and given all the objects that, that are in a typical image, like the one in front of me, you can manipulate small objects and to any child that's obviously wrong. So for example, uh, a few images like this. Now think of a split brain patient. So I think the, the best way to, to have intuition about integrated uh, information theory is to think about a split brain patient. Okay, So you have a patient who has experienced severe epileptic seizures and to alleviate those seizures, this, the, the neurosurgeon, this operation was first done in the, in the 40s, the neurosurgeons cut the, the entire, well, sometimes the entire corpus callosum, right? The 200 million fibers that connect my left cortical hemisphere with my right uh, cortical hemisphere. So now there are two cortical hemispheres that are sort of independent. And of course, we all know from the work of, um, of Roger Sperry at Caltech, it turns out that two entities now inside this, one, this, inside this one skull. As far as we can tell, there are two conscious beings inside this one skull. If you talk to this individual, to this patient, you're going to talk almost always to, the, to his, left hemis his or her left hemisphere, because as we know, um, um, in the left hemisphere, typically the one that's, uh, that's linguistic competent. The right one can sing. The right one can, if you silence it, for example, using a water test, you can talk, to, you can sort of query the, the right one in simple ways, and you can, it can sing, it can ask simple questions, et cetera, it can do very sophisticated tasks. So Roger Sperry concluded that to best of our knowledge, both the two conscious minds with two, con with two cortical hemispheres, but they're totally independent. They don't communicate with each other. So in that sense, there are two conscious minds inside one skull. And so you can show in principle, and people have done these sort of experiments, you can, for example, take a simple picture like this, this is the desk in Julio's office, and you can cut out the central part, and you can ask um, and hum a normal human, if you have your intact corpus callosum, you can easily ask them, uh, answer this question, do these halves uh, match? And yes, in this case, they do. And in this case, they don't, uh, they, they don't match, because obviously, they're taken from a very different part of, um, of, the, of the house. So this is something that, that um, a, a split brain patient could not answer. The left brain would see the, the right hemisphere, uh, would see the right image, and the right hemisphere would see the left image. And to both of them, they look perfectly fine. But only somebody that has this unified consciousness and the, the substrate of that has to involve the 200 million cortical um, and callosal fibers. Only a person who has an, has an integrated information could answer that question and say yes. This is another beautiful picture I found on the web two days ago. It really shows very nicely. And if you think about what would it take for a computer vision algorithm to recognize this, all the local parts, of course, perfectly highly accurate more uh, render, right, graphically render. But then, of course, you know, a child could tell you that's physical, just impossible, doesn't fit together. Now, if you think about local, all the local pieces of cortex that have access to local information that's not integrated as a whole, for, for, you know, locally everything is perfectly fine there, but of course globally it, uh, it's, a, it's a jarring image. You can look at images like this, it gets a little bit more, um, more sophisticated, where on the, um, where they are here, this, you have these abrupt, uh, you know, the, the, the towels are abruptly cut. You can th just think of how many images can you generate where you sort of play around with silhouettes where you just abruptly, you know, you can abruptly cut off an arm, for instance. You can, you know, like in this case, you can abruptly cut off a head. Um, you know, you can make changes in the skyline. For example, you can make an, a V-cut here in the skyline. Uh, you know, there, there are so many things you can play around with the colors, you can play around with the, with the shadows here. There's an innumerable number of things that you could do with images. And if you, as a normal conscious human person with normal visual experience, you will, if you, if you consciously apprehend the whole, you will immediately know there's something, there's something wrong. Of course, it depends on the granularity. If I just mess up, you know, a single pixel, you might not have the, the sufficient spatial resolution. So here, for example, we know, again, locally, this, this Lego uh, person, everything looks okay, but you have to know about perspective. And you know, certainly a child after seven or eight years old will know that this is physically impossible. There's something wrong with this image. It obviously can't be built in the real 3D, three-dimensional world. You can play here around with, you can cut out this. You can have another silhouette that's going to be more difficult to find here. But again, you can see this person here is half cut off. 
you can have things like this that are obviously, now again, think of um, in terms of computer vision algorithm, you know, if you do, for example, Google image search, uh, what would it take to recognize uh, that this is obviously physical, that this, is obvi this picture obviously isn't in the real world? Because once again, all the individual things are, are perfectly fine locally, it all makes sense, but globally, if you put it together, it obviously doesn't, doesn't make sense. So a case like this, this is, actually, this is actually a picture of a performance artist in Germany. It's actually a real picture, uh, the way that's what he does and for a living. Um, <laughs> So the idea is, if, if you want it, I mean, think of it a little bit like a capture. Remember, I mean, you all know these capture tests, right? When you have to go on and fill out credit card information, you have to sort of try to identify these words. It's getting more and more difficult because the algorithms are getting better, better doing it. So one, one, one can think of this a little bit like in, in, in that spirit of visual-based tests, and you have to ask, at what stage in the development of machine vision are we going to be at the point where you can show a an, an, an computer these images and the computer will be able to tell that that's something wrong or even to identify what is wrong. Now, of course, the insidious thing is if I just fix a single test, so for example, uh, two years ago, a couple of years ago, my, Microsoft had a test to, to, to identify humans and distinguish them from bots that, uh, that uh, asked them to distinguish cats from dogs. And of course, now, if you put a lot of computer power behind that particular question, you can surely make an, a local algorithm that all it knows and all it does is to differentiate cat images from dog images by doing you know, machine-based learning on those images. But the point about but this idea is that there are innumerable numbers of things that, that we have implicitly encoded in the structure of our visual cortices, and all that information is consciously accessible to us. And so you would have to make a computer in order, in order for, to build a computer that can, that can do this, you have to build a machine that, understand, that truly understands uh, images the way we understand images. So you can't just have a local set of very successful algorithms, like for example, Amnon Shashua showed us two days ago, you know, in terms of detecting pedestrian. Or as we know, there are now very, uh, very immensely successful um, um, machine vision system that can do face recognition much better than any human can. But this is highly specialized because this face vision system will, know, will not know unless, again, you program it to the motion, the emotional expression of the face. Or that, or if you show this, um, this uh, face identity software, you know, an image of you know, um, uh, something where a person, where Julius Caesar is shaking the hand of our president, then the, this, uh, this computer vision system could maybe identify the person as Julius Caesar and as, as uh, Barack Obama, but wouldn't know that obviously this is uh, a physical impossibility for them to have met, because these algorithms are very local, they have local information, they don't have access to global information. It's another picture. Obviously anybody can say that this is wrong, but locally it all looks perfectly fine. Um, so, um, our claim is that once we have machines that can pass this sort of test, not just in one instance, because once again, you can always build, a, if you have a particular test, like if all you want to test is the orientation, if you turn the orientation, Google has done this, if you want to test for the proper orientation of images, of course you can build up statistics of the natural world, and ultimately you can have an algorithm that distinguishes an image from this one. But if you, for example, locally mess up the orientation, or like, once again, if you think of all possible things that you could mess up in an image, and if a computer could understand all of that, then our claim is you would have built a machine that has integrated information, and that therefore, per, per the integrated theory of information, that has conscious experience of a different structure because its brain, its architecture is radically different, but it would have conscious experience. Now, it, for, uh, for human level intelligence, it would also be considered, um, for human level consciousness, it would also be considered intelligent. So the claim is that once you build machines that possess human level intelligence, that's equivalent to, to building a machine that has human level consciousness and vice versa. In this case, they're really identical. So in other words, if you have a general purpose machine that really understands just in the visual domain the entire range of, of images that we understand, then the claim would, it would be intelligent, at least vis-a-vis -vis, um, images, and it would also be consciousness. Now, of course, you can, have, you can have dissociations, you can have double dissociations. So in principle, it depends just what, what we mean by intelligent. Uh, if you have a machine like Mobile Eye that, that drives your car autonomously, like it looks like we're going to have in a few years, by some measure, of course, that's intelligent. Or Watson, if you look at Watson, that's intelligent, but it has no conscious knowledge about the world because it doesn't have access to integrated information, or it only has very, very little uh, um, integrated information. 
Likewise, if you think about the brain of a bee, I love bees at 850,000 years, incredible complex, they have learning, they have this, this dance, they have these collective decision making in, uh, when they look for their, for, for their next nest. But, so by, by any measure, if you look at the integrated information among 850,000 highly sophisticated neurons, at least the theory tells you quite clearly in its behavioral repertoire is so complex that you can assume, yes, it does actually mean something to be a bee, that the bee does have experiences, that there is a geometry behind the sort of the informational relationship build up in, in, the, brains, in, the, in, the, brain, in the brain of a bee. Yet by any conventional definition, it wouldn't be, in, uh, it wouldn't be intelligent, at least not human level intelligent. So what this predicts that if you have human level intelligence, it's equivalent to human level consciousness, at least in the visual domain, but it may be, it may be, it may be different for specific types of highly specialized algorithms for machines, and it might be different for certain types of biological consciousness that don't have, that don't share what we would call um, high level intelligence. Thank you. Yeah, but how do I start it? <laughs> well, no slides. Um, so let me uh, say to begin with that I'm very pleased to be here. I was an MIT undergrad in the days when everything worked. Um, and I was also on the uh, uh, faculty for 25 years. Uh, there we go. Um, so um, I'm going to just going to very briefly go over some basic features of consciousness. Um, I have to say, uh, just at the outset, that uh, I'm quite skeptical about the theory that um, Julio and Christoph uh, hold, the uh, theory of, of uh, integrated information. I think it's a theory of something. Um, and uh, both uh, Julio and, and Christoph mentioned that it's, a, it's consciousness that is also intelligence. But I think it lacks some basic features of uh, theories that are, are ought to be considered theories of consciousness. And I'll get into that. OK, so um, we can distinguish between three aspects of consciousness. First of all, there is a specific uh, a perceptual representation. I'll be talking mainly about perceptual consciousness. Um, so for example, the representation of red versus the representation of blue. And this is, I'm indicating that these are conscious representations by the little cloud around the, the red and the blue. So that's one aspect of consciousness, what differs between the conscious experiences of red and blue. But there's also the difference between an unconscious representation of red and a conscious representation of, of red. One of the advances in um, uh, contemporary um, uh, theories of perception is that we now understand that there's a lot of unconscious perception. Um, and a third feature is what makes a creature a conscious creature. So this is a conscious creature, and this, this isn't. Um, so what is the difference between a whole system in virtue of which one system is conscious and the other isn't? And there are four basic theories that uh, have been offered. There's the global neuronal workspace theory. And each of them, sorry, well, each of them differs in regard to what they take to be the representations, what makes a representation conscious, and what makes a creature conscious. So just going very briefly through these, because there's so little time, there's the global neuronal workspace theory that, that takes Brain representations, I, I've indicated here the representation of, of uh, motion in the uh, visual system. Um, and the idea is that what makes that representation conscious is that it's made available to certain mechanisms of high, higher cognitive mechanisms of planning, um, um, decision making, uh, control of uh, uh, behavior of a certain sort. Um, what makes a creature conscious? Well, that's, I put that in parentheses because in all the theories of consciousness except the one that uh, Christoph and Julio advocate, the, what makes a creature conscious really is a kind of a byproduct. It's not a serious aspect of the theory. What makes a creature conscious is just that it has a conscious representation. Another view is the higher order view of, of first put forward by Locke. Oh, I should say this is um, uh, Bernard Barr's uh, Stan Dehaene and Jean-Pierre Changeux, uh, John Locke, 
Uh, the idea there is that a conscious um, uh, state is a state one has a, a, another state about. Um, uh, it can be a thought or some other kind of state. Um, and then there's the physicalistic view, uh, put forward perhaps first by, by Hobbes, um, but in the modern era, put forward by uh, Francis Crick and Christoph. So Christoph appears on here twice. Um, <laughs> now, I've purposely put him in this case as being a little wild and crazy with orange hair, because I think that the informational theory does fit that. Um, <laughs> um, so um, the, I, this is, the, this is the, the, the theory that I hold. Um, the, and, and it, uh, the key feature here, I've put the, the, the important part of the uh, theory in, in, in red. So in the case of the global workspace theory, it's this broadcasting. In the case of the higher order theory, it's this attributing by a higher order thought or higher order state. In the physicalistic case, it's both. It's both what there's something, brain representations, and there are various proposals to, as to what makes those representations conscious as opposed to unconscious representations. In the case of the informational theory, the key notion is that uh, uh, phi, as you, you've just heard, in, uh, 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 and it's a, it applies to a system, a system that has many different possible states, and that such that, that and an a system that is also integrated. So that's high phi, but it's a little unclear what this theory says either about perceptual representations or about what makes them conscious. And this is the crucial thing, what makes them conscious, as you'll see. Um, so the key fact that I'm going to uh, uh, present that I think is a kind of a test for a theory of consciousness is how does it deal with certain cases in which a single representation can have a conscious and an unconscious part? And I'll just give you some examples. In order to understand the examples, you need to know about a neuropsychiatric syndrome called um, a visuospatial neglect. It's usually the left side of space. This is the drawings of a, an artist who uh, had a stroke, right-sided parietal stroke, and that keeps the people from having conscious perception of the, le of the left side of space. And here's how he drew himself shortly after the stroke. He draws his, he just draws one side, not the other side, and you can see the gradual improvement. Um, now here is a, an experiment that shows, uh, among one of many experiments that shows that a single representation can be, have an unconscious and a conscious part. Now here is, a, uh, what this is, is um, th these are uh, uh, um, an experiment done by Tony Rowe in which a neglect patient who couldn't see the left side of figures was, were, was given um, um, some examples of the muller lyer illusion and the so-called Judd illusion. And the key thing here is this, is um, this figure um, looks the same to the subject as this figure, even though the left sides are different. Now there is, this is the object, he's asked to bisect the line. Now there's the objective center of the line, and this subject uh, um, um, perceives the center to be shifted to the right. So there's an overall rightward bisection error, but there's also a normal influence of these brackets. Despite th not being able to see these things, they have their normal effect. And this is a, a common effect observed in um, a neglect, which is that the patient shows, shows that, he, that he sees the whole object, although partly unconsciously. Here's another example where the subject fixates here, the subject does not see this, does see this, but if it's rotated, the subject sees the, the part on the left, showing that there was an object representation which was tracked throughout this change. Um, here's a, another kind of, of case, which um, I won't have time to explain very, very, uh, uh, in very much detail, but. There's a, a, a way which uh, Christoph's lab has much explored, um, uh, which is in its most important form uh, uh, was actually invented by a postdoc of Christoph's, called continuous flash suppression. It's a way of making a stimulus invisible. Um, and I, I won't go into the details, but what you, what you have uh, here is, uh, I won't even describe what's up there. What you have is a, an invisible, um, fearful face 
that becomes more and more higher, higher and higher in contrast, while the thing that makes it invisible decreases in its invisible making power. And what you find is the fearful face breaks through the cloak of invisibility faster. So this is time on this axis. This is a fearful face, breaks through in a little over two seconds, whereas a happy face takes two and a half seconds. Um, and a neutral face takes somewhere in between. So a fearful face breaks through the cloak of invisibility faster, showing that it is um, uh, seen unconsciously, and that unconscious representation then can become conscious. So this is a single representation that is conscious at one time later, but had earlier been unconscious. So the idea here is, the question is, what does a theory say about what makes a content conscious? Now, the pr problem with the informational theory is it's a theory of systems. It isn't clear how it can even apply to a single representation. Um, it doesn't seem to be geared for that. It seems to be geared for a whole system being either conscious or, or unconscious. And the examples that you've seen are, uh, are uh, in cases of um, uh, slow wave sleep, anesthesia, the cerebellum is a completely unconscious thing. But what is it for a single representation? We know from the David Marr generated uh, theory of vision, we, we know that there are individual representations which are structured items in the visual system. We know that they can be conscious at one time, unconscious at another. They can be partly unconscious and partly conscious. But how is an inf a theory of integrated information going to try to explain that? Now, I suppose one thing it might say is, well, it becomes more integrated. But I, I'm not really sure what this would really come to in terms of the, the constructs of the theory. But there's also another problem, which is that we know that unconscious representations are in some ways better integrated. And there are some famous studies that show that people integrate um, uh, large numbers of items better if they don't think about them than, than if they do think about them. Um, uh, so it looks like the, uh, the, there's a special kind of integration, conscious integration. But if we say that, we haven't really gotten anywhere. Now, uh, let me move just briefly to the um, issue of um, uh, 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 consciousness versus intelligence. As both uh, Julio and Christoph said, it is a daring thesis of the, um, um, of the integrated information theory that um, consciousness and intelligence, and by the way, intelligence here is used in the sense of this Turing paper where it really just means the capacity for thought. It's not something that is, it could be measured by an IQ test. It's rather whether you're a thinking thing or not. It's not a graded thing. Um, and the, as I said, the examples that uh, Christoph and, and Julio give are all um, uh, cases where, where um, consciousness disappears, like in, the, in epilepsy, anesthesia, slow wave sleep, and the cerebellum, et cetera. That's, those are low five. But of course, the capacity for thought disappears in those cases, too. Um, now, we have cases where, which we know, know, or I think we know, that are cases of consciousness, but unknown thought capacity. Um, see if I can get one to come up here. There's an example. And we have other cases, hypothetical cases, where, they're known, uh, where there's known thought capacity but unknown consciousness. And there are a few examples, <laughs> at least hypothetical examples. So I guess what I'd like to know, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, it, I think we'd need some pretty powerful um, uh, argument or evidence to think that consciousness really was a kind of thought. Certainly at the conceptual level, they seem very different. And we've seen the examples I've given are, are uh, give you a very specific way in which they differ, which is that with um, um, intelligence, it makes no sense to talk about the intelligence of a single representation. It makes no sense to speak of a single representation that is first unintelligent and then intelligent, or has an unintelligent part and an intelligent part. But as we've seen, it does make sense to, to, to speak of a single visual representation, which is partly unconscious and partly conscious. So it looks like the, 
the, the um, um, integrated information theory is a theory of the, uh, you know, something different. So I think that a good theory of consciousness should distinguish these things, and that's the end. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. And as you, as you saw, and as we could have expected, uh, there are different points of view about uh, consciousness and intelligence. And I want, following this, I want to make, you touched upon it very briefly, but uh, I would like to see if we can elaborate a little bit, at least on where you stand, not necessarily what the truth is, but certainly in consciousness we have more than intelligence uh, that we are trying to explain uh, there is this thing that makes the discussion of consciousness so difficult and so different from the more standard uh, scientific discussions that we assume we know from our first hand experience that um, we have some kind of internal feelings we have what in the uh, uh, more um, accept a jargon in the field, we have some kind of qualia that are associated with different things. And we always ponder, we are not sure whether or not even intelligent machines have something like qualia, which can be the perception of red or pain. And I think that people have not discussed it much, but there is also something about cognitive qualia. There is a difference. You can, uh, you can try to solve a problem by uh, mechanically following symbol around, symbols around and do some symbol manipulation. But sometimes I look at a problem and I see, ah, now I really understand what the whole thing means. And it's not a pain, and it's not redness, it's not heat. It's something about something more cognitive that goes from the uh, mechanical uh, symbol pushing and following to some sort of a feeling of understanding, which has some, something that I would call cognitive qualia. And I was wondering, from the theories about intelligence that um, uh, Julio and Christoph uh, um, briefly outlined and what Ned was saying, what is your feeling about it? Do you think that trying to explain something about this subjective qualia, is it included in general in the theory of information and computational approaches to, uh, to the brain? Is it something different that at the moment we have to put aside and uh, will simply not be encompassed by our theories? Or is it something that, uh, as Sidney Brenner suggested, um, sort of the metaphor to the questions about life. Is it something that will just go away and it will not be answered by yes or no, or here is the exact answer, it will just dissolve and will no longer be a problem? I'd like to go through the panel and see what you think about this. Well, the problem is certainly not going to go away. It's been, here for it's been here for as long as humans uh, are conscious. It's not going to go away because uh, we have difficulty understanding it. So the key difference between consciousness and black holes and viruses and, and genes and neurons is the consciousness has this interior aspect and the black hole and, gene, and genes don't have this interior aspect and that remains to be explained. It's a central fact of our existence that we have these, these conscious states. Now you allude to very high level uh, co uh, cognitive sort of aha and other type of states. Uh, ultimately, they all also need to be explained, and the difference between them and red and blue is, is ultimately the geometry of the informational relationship. I think right now, for tactical reasons, it's not as, it's not as easy to explore those experimentally, right? I can't I mean, manipulate it very easily in a magnet, although people have tried to do these aha experiences in a magnet using um, EEG. And particularly if you want to do animal experiments where you have access to the different representations, I, I think you need to do simple sensory forms of consciousness first. So, I, so that's why I think exploring vision and smell and, and olfaction, um, uh, olfaction and audition is probably much more practical. I don't think practical. it's so much about the difference between aha experience and redness, but whether the whole realm of phenomena, it's basically will be ex explained in terms of entropy and information and computation and speed of processing and how many states and so on or will there, something else will be required? For the, lo for the longest, I thought, no, I, th I think we, the, ultimately inf the answer has to be an information theoretical term. Information is the right idiom to think about uh, conscious experience. I, unless you, po you postulate some extra stuff that we, which I which assume you're not. So I think it's the right language. We may not have the right calculus yet, or we're still groping for the right calculus, but I think it's the right idiom to, under to understand. It's supervenient on highly organized pieces of matter, certain informational relationships uh, that arise out of their causal structure gives rise to, to experience. 
Can I finish with this? Sure. So um, philosophers have this uh, notion that uh, sometimes is called the explanatory gap. And the idea of it is this. Suppose I have a, an experience of something as something red. And suppose I actually know what the underlying brain basis of that is. Still, there, in, for any uh, brain basis that we understand today, the question will arise, why is that brain basis of that experience, the basis of the experience of red, as opposed to the experience of green or, the, or no experience at all? And it's commonly thought among philosophers, and I certainly agree, that no brain description we have today gives the faintest clue of an answer to that. So I think the only rational um, um, uh, conclusion to come to is that we have, there are missing ideas. We, now, some people go dualist and say, oh, that shows there must be a soul. But I don't go, uh, go with that. I don't think any of the three of us would, would go with that. Um, so I think the, the only thing to think is we lack the right ideas for closing this explanatory gap. So I, I think we just have to do our, you know, keep looking, deal with conscious phenomena, including cases where consciousness is present in one case and absent in another. Um, and many of this stuff is set out very nicely in Christoph's 2004 book. Um, I think only by pursuing that will we ever, can we ever hope to um, close that gap. I'm skeptical. It's going to be like the people who, you know, the, the birthers, right? Then, <laughs> no, there will always be people, see, no matter what you say, there's always this gap there, right? And, you know, we, we, we've seen where, where that leads us. I think we do have a cohesive explanation. It's profoundly counterintuitive. That's why people have difficulty, you know, wrapping their mind about it. it however, it makes, ultimately, it's about operations. It's about questions that you can pose, you can answer. And all the questions experimentally that you can pose, at least in principle, what part of the brain, how long does it take to develop, is it in children, when does it happen in a fetus, what, are, what about bees and flies and, and birds and mice and all of that, all those questions can at least in principle be answered by such a theory. So if all the questions that I can pose legitimately in an operational sense can be answered, what more do I want of a theory? Just because right now our intuitions aren't very well developed about it, because it's very counterintuitive, but it's consistent with all the facts, I think that we have to accept it. Same thing was happening with relativity and quantum mechanics. Profoundly counterintuitive, but ultimately we accept it. That's my point. So my colleague, Tom Nagel, um, has a nice example of um, trying to tell, explain to a pre-Socratic philosopher um, how it can be that matter is energy. And the, what he points out is, is they, that that pre-Socratic philosopher would have lacked a concept of matter and a concept of energy that would have allowed him to see how those two could be concepts of the same thing. And I think the same is true of us. We lack a concept of consciousness and a concept of the physical that allows us to see how they could be the same thing. I have no doubt. You do. I don't. I have no doubt that they are the same thing. <laughs> well, you have doubt what? No, you say you don't. I mean, you, you I don't have the right concept. I think we. Physicist. Okay. So. Okay, I'd like to move you in another. <laughs> that's entirely expected that we will not reach a conclusion on that. But since this is also about the brain, I wanted to. It was prompted a little bit what what Ned was saying. If we learn, I mean, it's something that Christoph you helped starting. I think that a very large part of the. Uh, program so far in the scientific study of intelligence has been on the so-called NCC, what is the neural correlate of consciousness. And many studies have been done on that, primarily finding clever ways of invoking in the brain relatively similar, by the same stimuli, relatively sim similar situations, but in one case conscious, uh, being perceived consciously, and in another case not, like in in rivalry and in many other, um, many other examples. Now, we all know and agree that the cortex is very important for generating or being involved in consciousness. But what do you think, now I'm talking about the brain side of it, what we all have learned from the NCC in more specific terms? I think if there is one um, surprising uh, recurring phenomenon that came out is that very complicated and informative brain states can be unconscious. 
that sometimes there is a lot in the brain that the person who owns the brain doesn't know about, but if you, lo you look with an fMRI, for example, into the brain of this individual, you can gain information about this, what this person is perceiving and how uh, some of his concepts are organized without him being conscious of it. So there is a lot of informative uh, activity inside the skull, inside the brain, which nevertheless does not reach consciousness. So there is something surprising, and can we say something more um, about what makes, what distinguishes those brain states which are uh, reach awareness and those that do not? Can you add any more from the summarizing 20 years of experiments on this topic? What, what would be the main take-home <coughs> messages? Well, okay, so, it, so as the, the most important one is the one Shimon pointed out because this was long time debated. It's not any brain activity that gives rise to conscious experience. It's not even any activity in the cerebral cortex that was long thought. So people made these arguments going back to the 19th century, let's see spinal cord, you get reflexes, but anything that's in cortex obviously has to be conscious accessible. And experiments first in the monkey and then later on fMRI experiments in human show conclusively that's not the case. There can be lots of, there can be literally millions of neurons flying away in your visual cortex, yet, yet you or the monkey is not conscious of the representations of, uh, that are associated with, um, with that. So, so I think that's by far the most, because that poses very stark in relief, similar to the cerebellum cortex. What, what is it about these states that give rise to conscious sensation? And there, it seems to be some sort of, it seems to involve many cortical areas, if you are conscious of something, typically an area in the back as well as area in, 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 in prefrontal, uh, prefrontal cortex, although it's still debated whether you cannot get activity only in the back of the, in the back of cerebral cortex and still be uh, conscious of it. It seems to involve relatively di uh, spatially distributed ensembles of, of, um, of, uh, of neurons that are somehow synchronized, either using, os uh, using high frequency oscillation, although there the link is closer to attention and, and or um, synchrony. Unfortunately, since in humans we don't have access to, uh, to the underlying neurons, it's very, very difficult to really, say much, to really say much more about it. We know it takes a couple of hundred milliseconds to establish. We know there are certain electrophysical signatures. If you put uh, uh, large-scale electrodes in, in, in patients, you can see there are certain electrophysiological signatures that, that, that are characteristics. But it's very difficult to make progress because of our extremely limited ability to query the, 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 the human brain. That's why I believe, as I said yesterday, we really need to, to instrument you know, animal brains where we can record from the individual cells. Because it may well, uh, may well be that's what I suspect, because conscious information is so specific, and we know one of the lessons of neuroscience is the sparse representation for high-level stimulus such as Jennifer Aniston. There's only a very small subset of neurons that respond to that, that you, know, th that you have this rapidly shifting representation. It's not a single representation. There are many representations. The conscious one is, is a single, highly integrated one, but there are lots of other ones that associate with it, and we need to be able to track them in real time to be able to read out in real time on a single trial the con a conscious content, and we can't do that right now. Julio? Well, there are many things to say, which I say nothing before. <laughs> so, um, first, it is indeed true that we need to do cellular level investigations of large swaths of cortex, ideally in the mouse, to see what's actually going on. We can't do that without understanding the underlying mechanisms. Again, even from a theoretical standpoint, you need both the connectron, the wiring diagram, and the activity patterns to even understand what might be going on. The two must go together. And that's coming. It will be coming in, you know, in the next few years. But even so, that's not enough. Not only do you need the theory to know what to do with that, and the claim here would be that you need to be able to see what are the integrated information structures that are generated by that particular causal structure in the cortex in that particular state. But I would claim that once we get there, we actually will see consciousness as the elephant in the room. Consciousness has always been the elephant in the room, but now it's the elephant in the brain. We're going to see this gigantic brain TV that Christo was talking about yesterday, and we perhaps will have a decent notion of the connectome underlying it. And if we just look at this flickering pattern, we understand absolutely nothing about what is going on. Inside there, among a fraction of those neurons and among a fraction of those connections, we don't know how big that fraction is. We know it's in the cortex, it's perhaps certainly in the back, as we heard. Inside that, there will be one set of those neurons connected in a certain way in a particular state to which there will be this fantastic shape corresponding. That is 
the integrated information structure corresponding to it. And lots of other flickering patterns of activity with very complicated mechanisms, like the cerebellum or elsewhere in cortex, will not correspond to any such big and overwhelming shape. It's going to be local little fragments that are important. They will hit each other, they will influence each other, but they will never be that beautiful shape, which I'm not claiming is going to be the shape of an elephant, but it's going to be as big as that. Now, one other thing I want to add to this uh, in response to what Ned said before. So no theory of consciousness would indeed be a theory of consciousness, I would assume, if it does not pretend to explain what a quala is, what the quality of an experience is, why red is different from blue and from a sound. And the basic idea, which we didn't really have time to explore, is that indeed an experience, its quality in all its aspects, is a shape in qualia space is a shape made of information relationship, of which I showed very few. I showed the information relationship generated by three binary gates coupled together, okay? That's really nothing. But something more sophisticated than that can do that. It's not a matter of how many units you have or how many mechanisms you have. It depends how they are put together, and it's actually very difficult to put together something that can generate big shapes. Now, one last observation I want to make on this is then, let's take, again, inspiration from neuroscience. And I showed you one slide in which there was an island of cortex, of fusiform cortex, preserved in a sea of nothingness. Everything else was destroyed. And I said, we would like to know whether that patient is experiencing pure color, what you would call a representation of color, which is a pretty complicated thing to do. You need sophisticated networks going from the retina to fusiform cortex to actually extract color and color constancy and all of those things. So will he be experiencing red when you show him a red pattern and nothing else, versus uh, there is a nice converse case, which was recently described, of a person who has a lesion probably genetic in the very same area, but everything else is fine. So that area now is off as opposed to on. And that is a person who experiences everything like you and me, more or less, but just completely lacks color. So these are chromatoxic patients with a very specific lesion. So now, here we have the two cases. In one case, there is a very nice mechanism that can have a representation of red. If you want to call it a representation, it could tell red apart from any other color perfectly nicely. But I would claim it has not the slightest idea of the fact that red is a color. It doesn't know about black and white. It doesn't know about shapes. It doesn't know about space. It doesn't know about thoughts. It doesn't know about anything. So a color cannot be a color if you cannot compare to all the other things it is not. The other guy knows the, all, all those things. That's why he's conscious. This context is gigantic for him. He's just lacking a little set of information and relationship, which is what adds color to the overall picture. But there is a big difference between a picture without color and no picture at all. OK, I think our time is almost up, but I'd like to open it up for if people have some questions or potentially answers, that would be a good thing to um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Is the microphone or? People down there, yeah, select one, good. Uh, I'd like to hear the panel's thoughts on the distinction between, if they see any, between consciousness and self-awareness. So is consciousness a necessary but not sufficient requirement for self-awareness? And if you had a machine that you gave the Kristoff test to, and you gave it all these pictures, and it could identify all the discrepancies and problems with it, what would it do if you showed it a picture of itself? Would it say, that's me? Well, okay, so you're using uh, two words. So there's consciousness and awareness. Now, uh, Ned has written extensively on that. Maybe I'll let him comment on it. So if we just talk about the difference between consciousness and self-consciousness to stay consistent, I think the difference is only in kind. It's consciousness reflecting upon itself. You have a, let's say you have a body-based representation, and that's probably how it evolved, you know, in my somatosensory cortex, and then, con and then this is included in the conscious representation, then you begin through a recurrent connection to reflect upon yourself. So I think it's just a special case of, um, of consciousness self. And of course, there are some patients who've lost consciousness, self-consciousness, the Cotard syndrome, they might think they're dead, they might think their skin is rotting, etc. yet they still have access to other forms, you know, they can perfectly well see color. So self-consciousness in, in this reviewing is just one particular aspect of, of, um, of consciousness. Yeah, I would agree with that. But I think it's important to note that we have some evidence that 
in some cases of consciousness, the self part is suppressed. So there's reason to think that self circuits are, are, are um, deactivated or less activated in dreaming. Um, and Rafi Malik has shown that uh, so, so called self related circuits um, are deactivated when doing a very demanding sensory motor task where the subject is clearly conscious of the stimuli that are, are, are being used. So, um, of course, when we think ourselves, no, I'm, I'm looking at something, I'm, I'm conscious of it, you know, our self is, the, the, uh, those self circuits are very active in those cases. Um, so we think that's the paradigm, but maybe it isn't. Let me also add that I think that coming to machines, that at least some form of ability of a system to reason about the system itself is not very magical, and I don't think that by itself leads to some unexpected consequences. I don't think it's a big problem to have a computer program that reasons about some structures of the program itself, uh, and I don't think that this by itself will suddenly open the door, and uh, we have reasons to believe that uh, the ability to, of a system to self-represent or self-reflect at least on some aspects of the system itself, uh, it sounds sort of very special, but I'm not sure that it will lead to something uh, uh, spontaneously, to some, something extraordinary, just putting uh, such a cap capability inside an artificial uh, device. Let's move to another question, uh, but can you wait for, uh, is there a microphone? Thank you. I've heard it said that a fish has no word for water. Speak with louder. I'm not sure it's on. What's that? Um, I've heard it said that a fish has no word for water in the sense that consciousness is the water that we swim in. Um, so I'm wondering, in the scientific method, what we do is we externalize an object in, this, um, in order to study its properties systematically. So I don't see how we can externalize consciousness because we have to find a place to stand outside of consciousness in order to um, <clears throat> look at it and vary its properties and analyze it systematically. So it doesn't seem to me, for example, consciousness is the basis of experience. So how can we use experience to study consciousness? I don't, I don't see that anybody's even... Can we use thought to study thought? <laughs> Pardon me? Do you think we can't use our own thinking to study thinking? What's wrong? What's, what's the problem? Well, it's um, maybe in the sense of the Aristotelian notion that certain forms of knowledge are appropriate to certain objects of knowledge. So we can use our thinking to study thinking, but not as I mean, a scientific method. Every, every psychologist, every time you put a subject in, a, on, in front of a monitor and you manipulate the image, the color, the motion, and you query the answer, do they move, does it move to the left or right, is it red, green, all of that, we, we probe conscious experience. The subject is having a particular type of conscious experience, and we're asking some information about it. And we can do it, it's highly reliable, you can do it in large population, you can do it in animals, you get highly reliable results. All of that shows us you can actually probe the structure of conscious experience under, under reductionist laboratory conditions. It can be done, it's done since 200 years, roughly. Okay, let's move to a... Uh, can we have one in the front? Um, Over I there, if we can move a microphone. Oh, to okay. this. I have a microphone. Okay. May I Very good. ask so, a question, Christoph? Um, yes. So I'm wondering about the what's wrong with this picture task and how it applies to other animals. I mean, you can't imagine a mouse doing very well with that task or a moray eel. So, so what does that task say or your definition of consciousness say about other species and consciousness there? That's a good point, John. So, so this is purely, I mean, I emphasize for human level, you know, to trying to compare human level consciousness and, and machines. So a mouse, you would have to do with it, because mouse also has all of its behavior tells us its, its similarity to us, its evolu close evolutionary kinship to us tells us the mouse is also conscious. Its conscious states are going to be much less complex. It probably doesn't have, it doesn't sit there and think about the past and project itself in the future, but it has these complex integrated state pertaining to its sensory domain, which is vision, which is um, uh, certainly touch. It has a, a very large amount of sensory cortex and of course olfactory cortex, right? Its world is probably much more redolent of odors than ours. So you would have to do a similar test, which let's say in the olfactory domain, where you create, you know, the, the odors in a natural world and then you do something that's obviously is highly unnatural. And you, in principle, you can have, thought about it. In principle, you can train a mouse to also do a similar test. Uh, it can be done. 
because I, yeah. It would be difficult. Okay, last question. Can we have one to, in the front? Uh, this gentleman behind, yeah, right here. Uh, thank you. I'm interested in the kind of consciousness one has in experiencing a good mood versus a not so good mood. Now, in the case of visual experience, one can see that the visual system has the capacity for discriminating a huge number of states. On the other hand, it is not so obvious that we can experience a vast number of different moods. For example, think of uh, the kind of relaxed moods that are pleasant but not intensely aroused. It seems that these, this is a kind of consciousness that exists. On the other hand, it does not seem at least from my point of view as someone who does not do experiments on the brain, that there is a huge capacity for different informational states. So it seems that intuitively this presents something of a problem to the view that uh, the two of you have been presenting. That's excellent, if I may answer that. Uh, it is true indeed that within specialized domain, the quality of experience may not have that great range. There may be just a few moods, as opposed to a huge number of visual pictures, just as you say. But what matters here is that those moods are in the context of everything else. So in other words, if you had a machine that just were able to attach a valence of good or bad to the world divided into two parts, that would definitely not be conscious, it would be minimally so, okay? Just a like a machine that can only tell light from dark and nothing else. But if you add on mood to the, the vision of the world that we have, which is indeed enormously rich and for us very visual, then indeed mood can become conscious because it enriches one particular corner of the shape. And the very interesting possibility, which has not really been investigated, is whether the perception of mood, and for that matter pain, may actually be a newcomer in experience. It was always there, probably, for a long time there to guide behavior, but that it was incorporated in what we actually experienced. That may have been a late phylogenetic development that made it possible to be consistent, have the largely visual world picture we have to which we need to add a valence. So it's a very good point. Thank you. Okay, very last question we, before you have to adjourn. Uh, okay, if you can give it to one of the people there. Thank you. Could you uh, comment on uh, uh, claims that uh, meditation uh, creates another third kind of a state which has been observed in images and uh, what it, how it relates to the other states? I am not an expert on meditation, though we are studying something on that, but I have been told and I've spoken to meditators you know, there are, of course, many kinds of meditation, but the most interesting uh, from our point of view, I think, is there are some states in which supposedly the meditator is highly conscious, but let's say of nothing at all. So hardly any content, but high levels of consciousness. There is an interesting prediction that comes from looking at consciousness the way we discussed today, which is if you have a very complicated system in terms of its mechanisms, but it happens to be in a state in which, let's say, none of the relevant neurons are firing. Well, that's a very special state, but still it is a state, and it generates a shape in this informational space. And maybe that might be the state corresponding to I'm very conscious, but of nothing at all. Okay, for, with this, let's conclude. Thank you very much, everybody here on the panel.